Really excited. Thanks for joining Evan here. Mark, do we have a sock reveal by any chance? Oh yeah, sock reveal. We got the we got the Bitcoin roller coaster socks on today. So Bitcoin roller coaster. Had moon on yesterday, but that didn't work out so well. So I got the roller coaster on today. <laughs> nice. Um, all right, guys. So we got a lot of ground to cover here. Uh, like I said before, we've kind of covered very high level macro situation. We've talked about uh, crypto. I really want to knit those two things together and get your view on monetary policy, everything that's going on in the Fed, and specifically how that is translating into our industry, into crypto. Yep. Anyone who wants to take it, what are your thoughts? Um, you want to go first? Go, go ahead. <laughs> no one wants this so, one. I'll just say uh, shit show. Uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean I, I, I how can, many I different can, ways can we say shit show? I yeah, I mean, look, we, we, <laughs> we, your French? we yeah. turned money, dollars, into uh, toilet paper. And everyone's talking about the dollar being strong, which is comical, right? It's, it's less weak than the yen and the euro, which is what makes up DXY. And relative to other things of value, like gold, uh, ultimately like Bitcoin, everyone's like, oh, Bitcoin's down. Like, in the last two years, the Fed, in their infinite wisdom, created 50% of all the dollars that existed in the history of our republic. 248 years, printed half the money. So what should have happened to the price of Bitcoin? It should have doubled. It did exactly that. Exactly doubled. Stocks, all time, well, not all time highs lately, but people talk about the all time highs. If you price in toilet paper, if you price in gold, they're dead flat since 1996. So this, the cult of Kelton, the modern monetary madness or modern monetary theft is maybe the biggest policy error in the history of a really bad period since 1913 when the monster from, or the creature from Jekyll Island was created. Mm. But I don't feel strongly about any of that. No strong opinions. Well, I mean, look at, the, look at the 30 year channel for interest rates, right? And, and, and the, the downward channel, which was broken uh, as a result of, of the excessive printing and, and quantitative easing during COVID um, is completely unsustainable. It's killing Japan, it's, it's killing Europe. And so the question becomes, okay, yeah, the yield curve control is, is no longer working, but we can't sustain a model where we're the only country in the world, major country in the world, not in recession. It's just not possible. And, and so something has to give there. I think the, the, the great pause is coming. Nothing goes straight down, nothing goes straight up, uh, except maybe when you're in, in um, you know, hyperinflation, which we're not in yet. But you know, at some point, the, the macros are gonna have to give way to what I call the great pause. And, because we've already hit a brick wall. The fact that there was a, a, a blip yesterday in, in the inflation numbers, in, in my opinion, is, is kind of irrelevant. Uh, because like I said, nothing goes straight up, nothing goes straight down. And you know, I think what you're gonna see at some point before the end of the year is, oh my God, this has hit a wall. And th now their message will be, we're, the Fed will be, we're patting ourselves on the back because um, we did exactly what we were supposed to do. We slowed everything down. You know, inflation will come down, but we're gonna be in a deflationary environment, in my, in my opinion, by this time next year, Yeah. right? And, and that's a disaster mm. relative to, you know, what's going on. And, and at that point, you know, the, 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 it'll be too late, but the, the, the great pause is coming. And at that point, it's game on for risk on assets because they're going to have to find a backdoor way to prop up the euro and the yen, or we're in big trouble, or collectively in big trouble. And and so that's, in my opinion, that's when it's game on for risk on assets. And you know, it's just a question of is it Q4, Q1, and the big picture. It doesn't really matter. Um, you know. Yeah, I'm not as catas cataclysmic uh, as usual. Um, but look, this is the first time that I can ever recall that the Fed is making policy based on the most lagging indicators that we have. So, I mean, I've been watching this for 30 years, and at, at some point, the Fed usually says, well, um, we know CPI is going to come down. We don't need to go crazy on tightening. And, um, you know, we're, we're not seeing that. I mean, the, the CPI and the unemployment rate are the most lagging indicators. All the leading indicators are suggesting a significant slowdown in growth and inflation. So, I mean, I'm, re I'm reminded of 1995 when Greenspan in the summer said, um, and this was after the big tightening in 94, he said, you know, there'll come a time when growth is slowing or we expect growth to slow significantly and inflation. And even if the CPI is still rising, we won't be tightening. 
right? And that laid the groundwork for a big move from 95 into 2000. And so Greenspan, um, who I think was, you know, you know our, our best central banker, um, really understood nuance and understood the data in a pretty deep way. And I think Powell uh, it, it does not. And, um, you know, he comes from a different background. And it's a little shocking, to be honest, because some of these four leading uh, indicators, and I've put a whole bunch out on Twitter, are really, you know, nearly diabolical. I mean, you've yeah. never, you know, it, it sort of suggests that ISIM, for instance, is going to be, you know, potentially below 40. And maybe in the next three months, even below 45. The Fed has never been tightening when that indicator has been below 45. So the last thing I'm going to say is I think the Fed got whipsawed twice. So they were right about transitory, but they were wrong on timing. Exactly. So they, they, were, um, they then turned at the point when inflation, which has broadly peaked, I think, already, but the, the CPI is peaking now. They turned again at the highs to go more aggressive when they should be backing away. They themselves and, have become and so, a trailing indicator. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> what's unfortunate about that is that there's been massive destruction in liquidity. We haven't felt it yet. Um, housing is going to feel it. Um, you know, I think uh, you're seeing even things like used car prices, you know, collapsing. Um, I mean, I use those words collapsing, uh, diabolical, but, you know, they're very obvious to anybody who's been in the macro game for a long time. And so, it's sort of not clear to me what they're really doing. Like, what am I missing here? Because every guy well, they like got hammered. Uh, to your know. point about Greenspan, I think I think that they got hammered in the press by the definition of the word transitory, and we're too focused. Yeah, but that on shouldn't that. matter. Of I course, mean, the it press shouldn't matter. Doesn't but, know anything. Right. Of course, yeah. it shouldn't matter. But it's politics at the end of the day, and uh, that was mm -hmm. the the one beauty of Greenspan was is he didn't <clears> care about the politics and the perception. Well, he, cared he knew about he reality. was smarter than most journalists. Exactly. If yeah, but, but I, I think the, no. the bigger problem is that they were even talking about these people, right? A friend of mine says it best, right? I remember a day when I didn't know the names of the central bankers. I longed for that day to return. And now we view them as gods and on the cover of magazines. And, and look, the central bank was created in 1913 uh, to emulate the original central bank that was created in 1607 by the Rothschild family to steal the wealth from the masses and give it to the rich. That's what central banks do and they're really fucking good at it. And they've been doing it forever through this thing called inflation. And inflation, this idea that it's somehow good for you, it's somehow good that over a 30 year period, half of your purchasing power should be stolen. Why is that good for me? That is not good for me in any way, shape or form. And so now it's accelerated. Like I live in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and in theory, according to Zillow, my house went up 40% in value in the last 12 months. My house did not grow. It did not get more efficient. It actually wore out. I had to put money into it to keep it stable. It didn't go up. What happened is the toilet paper, which we all spend to live, got devalued. So it's not, we don't have inflation. We don't have inflation. We have currency devaluation. And this is how empires end. Every empire in the history of mankind has ended the same way. Cronyism replaces capitalism, then the People at the top overspend. They get into debt that they can't pay back. And when you have too much debt, you have four options. You can pay it back. You could tax all the wealth of all the people in America. All the wealth, forget income, all the wealth, you could not pay the debt back. You can restructure it, but then you gotta have someone take the other side. China stopped buying our debt. Russia stopped buying our debt. The only people that are buying our debt are stablecoin issuers, which is kind of interesting. Okay, then which is interesting, it's actually interesting, which is the one reason stablecoins might be allowed to exist, because they will buy the toilet paper that the government Well, we talked about creates. the other problem with that, though. It's no, scary. no, no, it is a problem, but so, it, but, it... But the, the crypto corollary to that, which I think is fascinating, is if you think about what's happening with the upgrades to Ethereum, it's actually the opposite, right? So somebody asked me to explain it in, in kind of macro terms, because I can explain the technical terms, but think about it this way. What, what would happen if every time you walked into a supermarket and paid in cash, the person, the clerk, took out their, match, their matches and burned Burn them. two out of the three pieces of paper that you were using to pay for what you were paying for at the store. 
That's actually what's happening with Ethereum now, right? It's, it's by far becoming, well, it's about to become the most deflationary asset that we have. At the same time yeah. that we're moving towards this great pause via our, our friends that are the lagging indicator now, where they're gonna have no choice but to do the opposite, right? And figure out how to reinitiate, you know, restart the fire of quantitative easing. It's, it's I mean, if, you're, if you believe in the network effects of crypto, it's, it's incredible time. Mm -hmm. It really is an incredible time. Um, uh, and it's just a question I, I, of timing. I would say one thing before I forget is that yeah, I think it's pretty interesting uh, that, you know, just this crowd here today uh, is almost twice the size as the crowd last year. Right. Mark and I did this last right. year. Right. I was very surprised. I guess it's, um, you know, in theory, we were in the middle of a pretty big bear market, right? Um, a lot of these coins are down a lot. Yep. Um, but I think what this shows is that the general level of adoption is out uh, of the space is outpacing this cyclical macro whatever. And um, you know, it just I, I am you know super surprised, but you yeah. know happy and, and 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 maybe that's also because um, it's not just about Bitcoin or Ethereum. There are lots of different interesting projects. There are lots of um, you know, um, ways that we're upgrading the quality um, of certain blockchains, call it quality of people in the space, um, et cetera. Well, when I did the, the closing talk at, at the DAS event in 19, right before the lockdowns, this was the last live event, uh, I made a statement that every stock, every bond, every currency, every commodity, every piece of art, every bottle of fine wine, every collectible car, every piece of real estate, every private business, every everything, everything of value in the world will eventually be a token. And people were sniggering and, and like, yeah, whatever. And, and now we know it's true, right? Y'all are, are proof, positive, the talent migration into this space that has recognized that this adoption of technology, this evolution, it's not a revolution, it's an evolution of technology, that everything of value will be a token on a blockchain. Not a coin, not a thing. It's literally a line item on a public ledger. Everything of value will be that. And every transaction of value will happen in digital assets. And the fact that that, as Dan says, is happening and will continue to happen has nothing to do with the price of a coin on, a, on an exchange. Or Fed policy. I mean, I think that's yeah. the important thing is that it's an inexorable move forward. Like, this is... That is the macro. The macro is not TradFi legacy world tweaking short-term interest rates. That will have impact on yeah. well, you know, liquidity cycles, but the real macro is the macro of adoption. And so- Internet adoption didn't stop in 99, 2000, 2001, 2002. No. It didn't stop. Smartphone adoption didn't stop in 2008, 2009, 2010. No, when Apple released the smartphone, their stock price fell 40%, and it didn't stop people from adopting mobile internet and having the ubiquity of information. But the thing that people, you all appreciate, but most people still don't appreciate, because 83% of the world in which I came from, the institutional world, uh, pensions and endowments sometimes, still have zero exposure. 83% yeah, have zero. So that's my hashtag, more get than, off zero. And they've gone more to than cash. 83. And they've gone to yeah. cash. No, I mean in crypto, they're yeah. just, broadly. Just right. Zero. And and it's it's this, this realization that, look, the internet busted the monopoly of information control. Information was controlled by governments, it used to be controlled by the church, then it was controlled by governments, and government state-owned media and state-influenced media, and that was busted wide open. And commerce was bigger than media, and that got disrupted by the mobile net. Well, the truth net, I used to call it the trust net, but we're replacing trust with truth, so I like truth net better, and the truth net takes value and banking and financial services and derivatives, which are orders of magnitude bigger than commerce. I mean, as big as Amazon is, it's tiny compared to global financial services. I mean, tiny, because that's not true. I'm like, just do the math. It's, and this disruption that's going to occur and is occurring 
isn't going to stop. No matter what the price of right. Bitcoin is, no matter what happens to Ethereum after the merge, before, who gives a hell? It, it's, it's how is the network continuing to grow? How many users? How many new companies are being formed? How many augmentations of an old? Because there's two ways to, to innovate. You can be a big E entrepreneur. You can invent something new. Mark Andreessen creates the browser, creates the internet. Okay, you can create literally entrepreneurs. You can take something new and make an old thing better. Avra Bank is a better way of doing financial services, and others will emulate that. But that isn't big e entrepreneur. Banking is not new. I'm not supposed to call it a bank, right? Well, actually, you guys are calling it a bank. So, um, but financial services in the digital age isn't different than financial services for thousands of years. It's just a better way from analog where we had to physically be present, right? The Buttonwood tree, you had to come. If you've seen the movie Gangs in New York, it was not a pleasant walk down the street with the guys with the top hats that would come steal your stuff. So then they went to electronic, Q-SIPs, but Q-SIPs are stupid. We have pieces of paper in Dallas, Texas that sit in file drawers that have the electronic Q-SIPs related to them. That's 400-year-old technology. We don't need the pieces of paper. Wipe out all of DTCC, which processes $1.8 quadrillion a year. That is a large number, okay? And it's owned by the banks, shocking, I know. And they're really happy that it exists because it's like a mutual insurance company. They get paid. So that will all move to digital. And when it does, it will create massive wealth, the greatest wealth creation opportunity I'm gonna see in my lifetime, for sure. Swift. Yeah. You're usually yeah. mentioned Swift, yeah. right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can I get a sense, What guys? was your question again? <laughs> I, I, I do not remember at this point. You're making my job easy. Um, can I get a sense of what drives these cycles in general? Because it is this funny thing about our industry. There are these very predictable kind of uh, cycles. Yeah. Not predictable, but they do behave in a somewhat so, uniform way. Yeah, there, there's a technology answer to that. Mm -hmm. There's a macro answer to that. And there's a debt cycle answer to that. And the macro is partially related to debt cycles. And there's, I think, pieces to that that, that kind of transcend the, the, the micro. But the, the technology cycles tend to move in S, what we call S-curves. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and you know I I've had I have slides that I don't use them much anymore but but the slideshows I've done for family office types and other you know potential investors and funds and whatnot that actually show that for everything from PCs to you know commercial software slash database software adoption whether it's Oracle or SAP to smartphones and then you know or internet then smartphones it all moves in these S curve cycles where you basically get early adopters, massive run up laggards. Um, and, and, you know, we're, we're at the very bottom of the S, you know, as it relates to, uh, relates to, to crypto, the broader crypto space. First 10% in 10 years, second 80% in 10 years, and then the last 10% in 10 years. So it's 30 year cycle. Yeah. And every single technology, including indoor plumbing, which is not perfect because in North Carolina, there's still some that don't have it. But Every technology follows an S-curve. This one is perfect. If you look at it mapped to the internet, it's almost perfect. We're in 1997, eight. And, and I remember being sitting at Notre Dame, we were investing in eBay and our board was like, are you an idiot? That's a garage sale company. Like, no, it's bigger than a garage sale. Um, 96X, made, it made Benchmark One, their venture fund was a 96X, the fund was 96X, forget the deal, the fund was 96X. Uh, Google, right, stupid name, 21st search engine, don't need it, but they weren't doing a search engine. They transformed the whole nature of information. You know that half the websites in the world are owned by Google? Half of the websites in the world are owned by Google, because every time you type a question, if it's, been, if it's been asked before, it sends you to a website that has all the information. If it's a new question, they create a new website. That's why it's so fast. That's why it reads your mind as you're typing and it knows exactly where to send you. And that's what indexation is. Genius idea, pretty simple in hindsight. Wasn't simple at the time, but we turned half a million dollars into 200 million. And there should be a quad at Notre Dame called the Google Quad. And so it's these big types of innovations that don't come along very often. They come along every 14 years. Why 14 years? Young people. Young people create everything new. Old people don't create new stuff because we're afraid. And young people don't know what they don't know. And 
before it was politically incorrect to talk about Bill Cosby. He, he had this funny record when I was growing up about this kid who could ride his bike anywhere. He'd ride up across the top of a, a swing set or on top of a fence. He'd do little circles on the ground, six inches off, and he never fell. First time he fell when someone told him about gravity. And so young people invent new things and we're in that stage. So 54 mainframe, 68 microchip, 82 personal computer, 96 internet, 2010 mobile net, 2024, which is still coming, truth net. And the truth net will transform every item of value in the world into a medium exchange. And so I had a conversation this morning with the Ledger guys. Someone is going to figure out how we can transact value seamlessly together in a secure way. And it's probably not going to be a Web 2 phone. It's probably not. It's probably going to be a device created for Web 3, I think. Ledger has something coming out, but anyway, yeah, I want exactly. uh, on, uh, on. I think this is a little different than previous things because I think the um, the the wave of adoption here overwhelms all the other cycles. So what do I mean? You know, we you know I look at NFTs for instance have the ability to touch every single business. I mean, music and. You know, maybe, I, I don't want to say it's a replacement of uh, religion, but there's, you know, people have a desire to get together in communities. And, you know, there's certain old institutions that are kind of fading away. Um, it can touch, you know, it's social, it's economic. Um, and I think maybe that's why there are so many people here, because in some part of some person's life, there's an application. So I don't think that's ever oh, digital. Been the case I, I don't even like the term NFT. I, mean, I want it to be called digital that? property rights. I want it to be called digital property rights because that's what it is, and it will be everything. To your point, I mean everything I know, but, in the world will be a social connection is bigger than a property right. Meaning, if Got people it. are doing things because they like to hang together, imagine like, and it can go viral and it's a massive network and all of a sudden you know you're in some metaverse and you're having a coffee with a guy in sri lanka and like that's insane if you think about it that's bigger than just that right well blockchains right. So, move up one level from a nation state right i mean we can all exist yeah i mean so it, it could be you know i don't want to say the end of nation states nothing cataclysmic or anything like that but there you know it is touching as i said some part of um of every person has some part that can connect to this world so that you know the vir the the network effect of virality that blows yeah. mm -hmm. all these other like cyclical things and the fed and this and that away and that's you know, and we have businesses, 10T, that we invest in. We have actually quite a few businesses that are doing better this year than last year. Crazy to, to think that. I mean, our exchanges are not, right? Volume is down. But there are definitely businesses that are growing, um, you know, doing different things. I mean, we invested yesterday in doodles. And people say to me, well, how is that consistent with what you're doing? Well, I mean, it is. Um, you know, they... I think 25% or more of the holders are women. Uh, that's a you know a, a whole group um, a, of people who are now part of adoption, at least in this tiny little way. Um, and so, like we're focused on, you know, where is adoption happening? We don't want to miss any place because we don't really know the future. We don't really know where adoption is going to really take off. And I just think that you know, guys getting on their MetaMask or mining Bitcoin is a very big hurdle, um, a bar to entry. And so there are going to be other ways that adoption expands and takes off. And um, uh, we don't really know. So at least us, we just try to, you know, have a diversified approach to it. But that's part of the reason why I think the people are here and why we don't have, you know, despite a pretty nasty bear market, like, you mm. know, a drop off. Right? Yeah. Where do you think, um, I, I guess just to ask this question, like, 
how big of a driver is Bitcoin going forward from here, right? Bitcoin is the king, right, is the original crypto asset. Um, many, like the market-driven behavior of Bitcoin traditionally has been Bitcoin leads and then other alts like tend to yep. follow sometimes like a magnified degree. Yep. Um, that, that is, we made that up. Really? Well, think about it, right? I mean, this whole idea of, of uh, you know, uh, the, you know what, where is Bitcoin at right now in terms of concentration of market cap is, what is it, 38, 39%, whatever? Yeah. We made that up, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it, the correlation is, is that it gets arbitrarily grouped together in crypto, mm -hmm. right? But that's just the history of the technology. If you look at where Ethereum's going versus where Bitcoin's going, the other layer one and layer two protocols, the divergence is significant, mm -hmm. right? And I think, but the relevancy of Bitcoin now depends upon a few things, which have, in my opinion, little to do with the rest of crypto, mm -hmm. right? I, I think a lot of it is gonna come down to now, uh, what is the incentive for developers to make Lightning really usable? Mm -hmm. Can it scale to a billion users? That's the, the big, big question now. Because the layer one, it's, it's, it's not quite, you know, uh, atomic gold yet in terms of like it can be changed, but it's going to be really effing hard to change it. Uh, those of us who were pushing for bigger blocks, you know, we know that now. Um, because the developers have no incentive. Nobody's going to put themselves oh, out there. I, to make I, I, I don't think there's anything more important than Bitcoin. Like none of this exists without Bitcoin. So that is the pure collateral at the heart of everything. At the heart of the bank is the pure collateral of Bitcoin. So, it, you know, is it a digital gold or whatever, whatever it is, none of this exists without that. So the value of that will never go away. Now, will it outperform or underperform? It's had a pretty good run the last 10, 12 years. Okay, I mean, 250% annualized, greatest return of any asset in the history of the world. So could it do that in the next 10 years? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm just saying that the developers and what goes on with Lightning, I mean, those are bonus points. Actually, I disagree with that because now it's about the utility. Yeah. So, so yeah, no, I completely me, disagree. Yeah, I know you so do. We talked about I mean, this. So, so let me put yeah, it in as context. As a macro guy, yeah. investing let me put it in, in assets, put it in abstract. context. So, the price of Bitcoin ultimately is going to come down to two things money supply and network effects. And so, and that's because that's what's driven the first 10 years, and it was easy to go from zero to 100 million people. Institutions hoarding Bitcoin is, is not going to drive network nope. effects. And as, as a company nope. that actually sells to institutions, I'm 100% positive that's right. It's the consumers coming in. I'm not 100% positive about anything. Yeah, well, that <laughs> ever. Okay, fair point, fair I'm point. Just I'm 95% positive. Just saying. 95% I mean, positive, that's right. And so the question is going to be how and why are we going to get a billion consumers to be holding and or actively using Bitcoin in the sense of a verb, moving it, not just holding it. Either way is fine. Whether they're holding it or moving it, I don't really care. To actually do it. That's unclear. And right now, the only way they can do it is on exchanges. That's not gonna work for a billion people, zero chance, because people just aren't traders. So then the question becomes, okay, how are we gonna simplify this for a billion people to wanna hold Bitcoin, right? For me, when I think about stable coins and other things which aren't really Bitcoin, totally different question. Neo banks and other banks and applications will, will figure out stable coins and making DeFi accessible. But for Bitcoin itself, that's a different issue. And I don't think we've figured out yet how to make Bitcoin accessible to a billion people. Well, no, that, that, that is the biggest, the biggest challenge is the ownership is still concentrated at the top. You know, the Gini is a silly co concept, but same idea. And the real issue is, I love it, when two people always have the same opinion, one is unnecessary, so these guys are very <laughs> necessary. Um, but if you think about Bitcoin, it is digital gold. Gold is the only money that exists in the world. It's the only asset that exists in the absence of a liability. That is the definition of money. Everything else is no credit. Debt. Right. Everything else is credit. It's backed by debt. That doesn't make it bad or good. It just It's a currency. Dollars are currency. Yen is currency. Euros are currency. They are backed by debt. They are not money. Money is gold. It has been for 5,000 years. But gold is not very divisible. It's not very portable. And so Bitcoin has a, a use case as digital gold. Now, gold is not money supply, just not. It is a piece, to your point, it's the foundation, 
Okay? Central banks own it, use it then to create fiat currency on top of that using debt. Now, could that all be replaced with stable coins and other crypto? Sure. But at the end of the day, that migration of financial services and rehypothecation and all the things that we do to make the world a better place, everyone's like, you know, you can't rehypothecate. That's wrong. I'm like, okay, look at every country in the world. Those that have fractional reserve banking suck. I mean, those who don't have fractional reserve banking suck as a place to live and grow and, and create wealth. And those that have good functioning fractional reserve banking systems are better. And that's probably an oversimplification, but that's a really interesting way of thinking about it. So ultimately, I surf at night on spaces. And I'll go to the, the Bitcoin space. I'm like, get out of here, you shitcoiner. I'm like, what are you talking about? I have more Bitcoin than you do. And they're like, well, you own Ethereum. And you own a Solana. And you're a shitcoiner. I'm like, stop. OK? Then I'll go to a Solana space. I'm like, get out of here, you maxi. I'm like, I own more Solana than you. What? They're like, you own Bitcoin. And that's a, and so this tribalism needs to end. The, the idea that, that they're mutually exclusive. Now look, the $64 trillion question, as far as I'm concerned, is are we going to have a single stack, Bitcoin, Lightning, L3, L4, all built on Bitcoin, DeFi for Bitcoin? Okay. Today, not possible. Not possible. Is it possible in the future? Don't know. But today, not possible. Or are we going to have a multi-layer stack like the internet, where you got TCP, IP, HTTP, SMTP, uh, FTP, and www. Could be Bitcoin. Filecoin, w Ethereum at the top. Maybe it's Polkadot. Maybe it's Solan I don't know. Maybe it's Avalanche. We can have both. Or you can. Or do you have both? Yeah. And have that's everything. a multi-chain world. Yeah. We can have and I don't know that we have to answer it. But the infighting and the tribalism is bad. Ridiculous. I agree. It's pointless. Can but, I, look, can but, 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 but the bottom line is: is the price of Bitcoin is down seventy percent because we've had the fastest money supply tightening in history, combined with lower retail usage mm. of the asset. That's no, it. no, I want to do, do That's it. One, one, one clarification. Bitcoin is up exactly what it should be from the beginning of the I, creation I of money. That. But what happened was price does not equal value. The value of the Bitcoin network is determinable to a very high degree of certainty using Metcalfe's law, right? Number of participants, transaction size, exactly. all of that is determinable. 100%. What happened last a year, a year and a half ago, February, the first case, and then again in, through November, was stupidity. Dumb people borrowing too much money and levering up Bitcoin and pushing the price, some would call it manipulation, to levels that exceeded the value. And any time that happened, and that's true today, stocks today are overvalued relative to their value. They're in the 90 third percentile. They've only been more expensive, 7% of all of history. Today, Bitcoin is in the two and a half percentile cheap to its history. The fair value of Bitcoin somewhere in the low 30s, high 20s. At 20,000, it's below fair value. So that, and that's the reaction to the tightening. But if you look at, we created 50% more dollar, 50% of the dollars, Bitcoin should be up 100%. It went from 10 to 20. It's exactly where it should be. I have a, I actually maybe to, I'm curious what you guys would think of this. I think there are just two different scaling roads essentially for this point for Bitcoin. Because if you think of Bitcoin as pristine collateral, um, what I kind of thought would happen is that like DeFi protocols would be using Bitcoin as collateral. People would, but they're not. Um, they're using. Right. We have to introduce trusted third parties to wrap the Bitcoin in order to exactly, do that. Today. Exactly. That's the so, problem. so they and it's aren't. no longer DeFi. So, right. Right. So that's the big obstacle. So I think from I think basically now the adoption mode for Bitcoin is actually outside of crypto. Big institutions buying Bitcoin, and I think they've basically probably won that almost uh, at this point. Like Fidelity, it got kind of leaked. Or I don't know if this is. I just saw the title from the Wall Street Journal, but they're going to roll out trading for not crypto. Bitcoin, right? So it seems like Bitcoin I is actually, a sizable. I actually, I partially there. agree with that. You're going to have two different stacks. Okay, you're going to have the the Western rich banking stack, which is where you're going, mm. and then you're going to have the Ukraine, Venezuela, Turkey stack, mm. where there is no institution and it's schmuck insurance against what the governments are doing, mm. and they're not interested in using Bitcoin via institutions because that's why they're trying to use it in the first place. 
Mm. right? And so they are going to be incentivized to understand what a key is because it's life and death. Nobody in this room, well, the non-computer scientists in this room are not incentivized to know how to deal with key management because it's not life or death. And so that's why you're going to see two different stacks emerging over time. Unfortunately, for the, the value of Bitcoin, the number of people times the number of dollars being moved in the life or death stack is very, is very, very small yeah. because the GDPs of those countries is very small. So yeah. it doesn't actually change the value of the relative network effects you know, via versus the rich person stack, which is unfortunately going to dwarf the other one, at least for, for a while. I agree with you, but I think even outside of the like developing economy stack, there's also just like the crypto native stack, which is like people, there are basically like two groups of people that want to get leverage in Bitcoin, which is people that want to do it on their Bitcoin. They go to centralized entities to do that. Yeah. And then there are other people that take ETH and they deposit it into sure, but, but, compound. But there really is no way to do that with Bitcoin in, 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 in raw Bitcoin form today That's the point without I'm a trusted third That's party. That's the point I'm trying to make. Well, so but the what, problem is, is this backlash against creating the institutions that allow you to do exactly what we're talking about. So it's the backlash against Celsius and BlockFi and, uh, and Voyager. And you know, you, you're supposed to hold your Bitcoin and, and never rehypothecate it. Look, if we're going to take our Bitcoin and put it on a thumb drive and bury it in our backyard, don't need that. We got that. It's called gold, right? That does nothing for us. Mm. It doesn't help us grow. It doesn't help us move financial services into this new tech world. Holding Bitcoin by itself as, as literally burying it in the backyard, stupid. But I hear people talk about it all the time that if you put, you know, not your keys, not your coins. Look, my dad is never, ever going to hold his own keys. He's 84 years old. He's very happy to own Bitcoin. He's very happy to have a coin. Oh, he doesn't own Bitcoin. Fine. You tell him he doesn't own Bitcoin. But he's very happy. And those institutions are getting us from the very few people that own it to the masses. And if we don't, in the absence of, of a global airdrop, which whatever that thing with the I you know, Oculus thing, or they're going to do your retina, bad idea. But other than somehow getting crypto to the masses, like I wish DM would have actually worked because we've got to you know, put a crypto in 3 billion people's hands mm -hmm. as a gateway drug. The, the most incredible thing about this to me is that Bitcoin is actually playing out Hayek's playbook for private money to the letter. Mm -hmm. And there was no internet when he wrote about this. There was obviously yeah. no Bitcoin as a result. There was no smartphones. It's, it's, it's doing exactly what he said would happen to a point. He said, first, if you had private money with a, with a, with a controlled supply, it would be hoarded first right. because it would be incredibly valuable. Then it would be spent because eventually it would become too valuable and it would make no sense to hoard it anymore. The question becomes, as you get those network effects and, and its value goes through the roof, right, because it's being hoarded, is it viable to spend it because we have a means for a billion people to do it? As it relates to Bitcoin, we don't have that decentralized means today. We have centralized means to do it. You can do it with Abra, right? You can do it with any exchange. But the, the people who are in markets where they can't trust the centralized people don't have the decentralized means yet. And it's unknown to me if we will at scale. I'm very bullish on Lightning, but it's one of those things where we don't know yet if the network effects will work at that kind of scale. I really hope they do. We just don't know yet. Guys, I promised uh, you guys were going to polish up your crystal balls. I'd love to do some forward-looking statements here, obviously with the, the understanding that that's, uh, that's not really possible. But this next 12 months, like, what do you expect, right? We've got the Fed that's talking very tough about withdrawing liquidity from the market. Uh, we do have the markets actually starting to price in Fed funds futures north of 4%. It doesn't look like if macro is sitting in the driver's seat right now, it doesn't look like they're taking their hand off the steering wheel basically anytime soon. So over this next like 12 months, do you think it's going to be more kind of steady as she goes, uh, which we would be expecting more turbulence? How are you guys just kind of thinking high level, let's say over this next period of time? Well, I don't think this is a trading market. I never have. Um, and I traded for a long time. Um, I think it is a, a buy and hold market. And I think if I look out even I don't know, let's say the end of 24, I think all the main assets will be higher if you just want to talk about price. Um, but I also think there are going to be, you know, there are these new gateways um, for adoption building. So um, 
we could have a much larger ecosystem without necessarily the price of Bitcoin or Ethereum going up a lot. But I do think certainly after the next halving, you know, we'll be over 100,000, you know, I think easily in Bitcoin if you want to, like, ask for a price. Um, you know, um, I, I think there's turbulence for the next sort of three to five months um, because of this macro stuff. Yeah. His, and I think Mark's point about the Bitcoin being what you said in the 2% most, I've two, seen two it. 2.5%. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's ridiculous. Like, if you're ever going to buy it, you buy it now, and then you buy some more next month. Yeah, next month, right. next month. Right. And yeah. I, yeah, yeah, the asymmetry is pretty severe right yeah. now. Yeah, the likelihood that it stays in the bottom 2.5 percentile forever is zero. I mean, nothing zero, but close to zero. Low. It's close to zero. So, look, I... Um, History is not kind uh, for these environments. Uh, there's a long-term cycle, 90 years. Uh, if you go back to 1840, uh, we tightened liquidity into a slowing economy. 1840. 1840, we tightened liquidity into a slowing economy. What, what were you driving? We created. <laughs> I, I'm just. 1840. I'm, we're talking about the future here. <laughs> I'm going to get to the future. We got to set the back context the next, for the next year. The, far, the, sign, two the farther back you look, the farther forward you can see. Churchill was right. So 1840, uh, the the there, there was no central bank. The the banks constricted liquidity. We went into something called the free banking era. Total disaster for 25 years. Um, and bottom line is is we had a depression. 90 years later, in 1929, 1930, uh, Smoot and Hawley did one of the dumbest things ever. Uh, put tariffs on, and we contracted liquidity into a slowing economy, turned a garden variety recession into the Great Depression. So here we are 90 years later uh, in the 2020s, and we are tightening liquidity into a slowing economy, and we already did the stupid tariff stuff. So we are uh, on the verge of what I believe will be another depression, not even recession. Now, it doesn't have to go that way, but here's the problem. I am actually modestly concerned that the dictator playbook is being played out by the current power structure. And the dictator playbook works like this. You concentrate the wealth at the top into your cronies. You then devalue the currency and impoverish the masses, and you get them to reelect you by handing them freebies. What are we doing? We're not giving out free electricity, but we're giving out gas cards and forgiving student debt. That is buying votes. And look at Venezuela, look at Argentina, they give away electricity, they get, they, that is how you stay, I could never understood how Maduro stays in power. But you, you get super rich at the top, you impoverish everybody else, and you buy votes. If that's playing out, if it's a sin, you know, sinister Saturday when, our, when we do our, our weekly thing, if it's playing out in a sinister way, then the shit could get really real in the next 12 months and you do not want to own very much other than gold and Bitcoin and, and cash and guns. <laughs> not cash not joking, guns, sadly. No. <laughs> um, yeah. I have been learning to shoot, actually. I never thought I would. Uh, um, let's see. I guess I would say three things. The first is uh, we clearly are approaching the end of, of, of a 80 to 90 year debt cycle. There's just no doubt about it. I think there's a really good chance this will be one where we can escape without millions of people dying in war. And I think that's, I agree. Th th there is a chance that could happen. And, and, and it's ironic that I'm, maybe for some of you that I'm saying it that way, but the reality is that would be different if you're not clear on the history of debt cycles. So that's good, I suppose. Um, you know, as it relates to crypto, I actually am looking out to 2030 and I'm, I think I'm at currently, just based upon price movements and a little bit of reallocation, I'm at 40% Bitcoin, 45% Ethereum, and via our, our asset management team, I, I think personally I'm at about 15% different alts. And I, I think that's exactly where I want to be. Um, and I think that uh, I'm looking at, at you know, as at kind of the macro, I'm looking at Bitcoin 2030 probably in the million dollar range. Mm. I think it's a combination of the network effects um, and and uh, the money supply changing, and I think I think the the thirty year channel for interest rates gets back on track, uh, because if it doesn't, <laughs> we're, we're screwed. 
Um, and, yeah. and so I don't even know what the alternative is for that. It's just catastrophe if interest rates don't get back. I don't think we're ever screwed. That's right. my, I have a different view. I just think we adapt and grow and just grow in different ways. I mean, I mean in terms of our debt, we're screwed. Uh, yeah. Maybe we could default on the debt. And then I think the, the third thing is I think the hook. I think the application is um, of, of, you know, of crypto are going to explode in the next five years um, in, in all kinds of you know, ways that we haven't thought of. You know, in 18, when we were in the down cycle, no one was talking about NFTs. Yeah, I would ju I'm glad we're ending on that because I agree with that optimistic view as well. And again, if you didn't go through that cycle, it felt complete. This feels completely different than then. It really does. Um, so let me leave me on one on, on one uh, really uplifting note, which is if you're in this room, you are part of the solution. And we are going to have so much freaking fun over this period. To Dan's point, we will adapt. We will not die. Well, short of the button, but we, we will be fine. And by committing ourselves to the future and to development of this technological evolution and being part of, of this new community that Dan's talking about, look, I tell you this all the time, I'm having more fun today than I've had in my entire career. And I love my career. I love working for endowments. I love building a little asset management business, but I love hanging out with y'all. The, the energy, the enthusiasm, the passion, the talent is like nothing I've ever seen. And I've been around a long time and seen a lot of, of these movements, but this is what it's all about. So thank you to BlockWorks for putting this together. Thanks you for being part of the community and being here. And uh, we are all gonna make it in a big way. <laughs> We're all gonna make it. All That's right. a little callback. <laughs> all right, everyone. Give it thank up. You. Thank you. That was the right tone to end it on, right? right?